Today on Uncommon Knowledge, NASA. Nowhere to go but up. Funding for this program is provided by the John M. Olin Foundation. Welcome to Uncommon Knowledge. I'm Peter Robinson. Our show today, The Future of the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, a conversation with NASA head Sean O'Keefe. In January 2004, President George W. Bush announced a new goal for NASA, a manned mission to Mars. Yet recent failures at NASA, from shuttle disasters to the over-budget and barely functioning International Space Station, lead to this very simple question. When it comes to manned flight in space, is NASA up to the task? Sean O'Keefe has a career in public service dating back some three decades. In 1992, the first President Bush named him Secretary of the Navy. In 2001, the current President Bush named him NASA Administrator. Two quotations. John Fitzgerald Kennedy, May 25th, 1961, quote, I believe that this nation should commit itself to achieving the goal before this decade is out of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to Earth. No project will be more impressive to mankind, close quote. George W. Bush, January 14th, 2004, quote, with the experience and knowledge gained on the moon, we will be ready to take the next steps of space exploration, human missions to Mars and to worlds beyond, close quote. John Kennedy's announcement in 1961 thrilled the nation and is still replayed on little monitors in the Air and Space Museum right there on the mall. George Bush's announcement of the mission to Mars received such a mixed reaction that the President himself didn't even mention it when he delivered the State of the Union address just six days later. From thrilled to, eh, what's happened with the nation and NASA? It's a journey, not a race. The whole objective of what John Kennedy was trying to define in the early 1960s was respond to international threat. We don't have that in this particular policy today. We face an entirely different set of threats. It's a journey, not a race. And the price for losing that race was unbelievably high. Today, we're about the process of building the capabilities. Okay, now let me... So the Cold War, NASA has a very clear justification. It demonstrates the superiority of American technology and by pretty di direct implication, the superiority of the American way of life. Okay, we'll grant you that. Today, NASA, according to the President's, that same speech I quoted, NASA expects to, sp to spend some $86 billion over the next five years. Now, in John Kennedy's time during the Cold War, everybody knew why we needed NASA. Why do we need NASA now? Let me, let me give this, Dave Barry, the humorist, often says that he has a test for federal spending. He pictures a, a woman he knows, a waitress. She works two shifts. She's a single mom. She's raising a couple of kids. And he says to himself, is it right to tax her to support this program? So you tell me why it's right to tax that Dave Barry's friend, the waitress, to support NASA. Great nations do great things. This is what we're all about. And every major advancement in the human condition over the course of history has always been attained by exploration, by the act of seeking discoveries. And sometimes we set out for one set of objectives and end up with an entirely different set of understandings of what we learn. But it's the act of exploration. It's, it's, it's yielding to the human desire to want to explore and understand and know more about that which we don't know, which is what the investment's all about. And indeed, for less than a penny of every dollar that the taxpayer contributes, that you're you know, uh, a hypothetical down person. To, down to under 1% of the federal budget. You betcha. Less right. than a penny of every dollar is spent on what we do to develop technologies, to devise the capability to explore. And from that comes a whole range of capabilities that we never would have imagined. Every single day, our lives are touched by the same technologies that were developed as a consequence of those words that were uttered in the early 1960s mm -hmm. on why we needed to go to the moon. Yes, it was about an international policy. Yes, it was about demonstrating the American prowess to develop technology to respond to a threat. But what we also developed along the way were things that we experience every single day that materially improve our lives. 
every time any loved one goes into a hospital for a cataract detection. Right. That methodology was developed because of the NASA technology, a NASA imperative to understand how that particular phenomenon happens faster in low Earth orbit. So, so your contention is, A, that there's something deep within the human spirit. This is, you have to kind of picture America the Beautiful playing in the background. But that's really the contention, that there's something deep in the human spirit that NASA fulfills. And B, that there are material ways in which our lives will somehow or other become better here on Earth because of what you're, you guys are doing. Positively. And, and right. it's not just American spirit. It is something throughout the course of human history has been demonstrated as the human spirit. Mm. All right. In his January 2004 speech, President Bush outlined three goals for NASA. Let's look at each. In that January address, once again, President Bush outlined three goals for NASA. I'd like to consider each one of them. Goal number one, I'll quote President Bush. Our first goal is to complete the International Space Station, International, the human spirit there, by 2010. To meet this goal, we will, we will return the space shuttle to flight as soon as possible, close quote. Now, let me follow that up by quoting Tim Ferriss, very fine science writer, uh, whom I'll quote a couple of times here because he knows a lot about NASA. Quote, the shuttle is already on its way out and the space station has been pointless from the beginning. Close quote. Why is the president right and, and Tim Ferriss is wrong? Well, yeah, first of all, I, I think the president of the United States has a touch more standing than, than most of the science writers do on this question in large part because the focus of what we're attempting to do on the International Space Station is not just in honor our international commitments, it is to develop a laboratory in low Earth orbit in microgravity condition that can only develop the kind of capabilities to understand long-term human endurance challenges, physiology effects, wait just a second, yep. that affect all of us, that is like that cataract detection question. What That's is, how it was divided. What will you be doing in the International Space Station that the Russians haven't already done in theirs? Uh, it's my understanding that they conducted just these exp this sort of experimentation on the long-term effects in, of space on, on the human body. Not to my knowledge. No? Okay, we're, we're still attempting to gather all the information. Look, we're, we're just now in our approaching our third year of continuous human presence in, in uh, microgravity condition. Mm -hmm. We've had lots of different shots that last two or three weeks at a time. The Russians have certainly had you know, a lot of experience in sending folks uh, onto space station near for extended periods of time, but months usually in calibration. This is the first time we've had a continuous human presence on the International Space Station for the last three years. Okay. This is the first time. All right, and you're testing these guys, the, the effects of space on the human body in low Earth orbit over extended periods of time. And let me quote Ferris again, who thinks the whole enterprise is pretty, is dubious. Quote, NASA's unmanned programs are flying high. Robotic probes have sampled the sands of Mars, mapped every planet in the solar system this side of Pluto, inspected comets and asteroids, and made incalculable contributions to terrestrial communications. They're the contributions to the way we live here on Earth. Uh, agriculture, geology, and weather forecasting, all at a fraction of the cost of sending astronauts up there. Meanwhile, the manned program is stuck in low Earth orbit. Close quote. What do we get from the manned program, which is vastly more expensive and, as we have seen, more dangerous than the unmanned probe. Why not drop the whole darn thing and take those billions of dollars and put them into unmanned Sure. This, is, this has been a debate that's been going on since Yuri Gagarin first flew in the early 1960s. Uh, but, but, but wouldn't you say that it's my impression that, that people are becoming less willing, scientists are becoming less willing to see all that money spent on... Well, it sounds like you've made up your mind. I mean, the issue is this is an old shop worn debate. Congratulations, mm -hmm. you're entering into it for what is now the fourth continuous decade of argument about should robots or humans do something. The fact is it's both. It's a balance. And the issue that somehow uh, robotic capabilities can do this exclusive of human beings just doesn't make it. What we see happening on Mars right now in spirit and opportunity is a fantastic achievement, no doubt about it. This is an engineering marvel. And what they've done in the last six months in collecting data and information mm -hmm. has been stunning. The fact is, if we had the capability today to send a human being there, given our cognitive skills as humans, to be able to adjust, adapt, reason, make judgments, we could have done the same science package in less than a day than what we've done in the last six months. Now, the fact is, we don't have that capability today. And you we don't have the means to accomplish that. You won't for two decades, isn't that about right? Well, we'll see. I mean, it depends on how fast technology moves. If you want to be a technology yeah. forecaster and know exactly when that's going to occur, come join us at NASA. But as it stands right now, what we're trying to devise is the capability 
in order to precurse those missions with robotic capabilities there to know what we're getting into and, and then avail ourselves of question. the human opportunity to really understand what's involved. You said it's a balance. How do you decide that balance? Uh, first and foremost, you have to make sure that the data is collected, the information is yielded, the facts are understood of what it is you're getting into by exposing a human being to those conditions. Mm -hmm. And that's the first big step that we're doing clearly on Mars, that we did on the moon, that we're going to continue to do as part of this exploration strategy the President's laid out. Let me give you a specific. On to the President's second major initiative for NASA. Bush's second goal to develop a new spacecraft, the Crew Exploration Vehicle, which undoubtedly is already being referred to everywhere as the CEV within NASA. Is that the acronym? You call Project it the Constellation, CEV? yes. Okay. Sure. By 2008, and to conduct the first manned mission in this new vehicle, no later than 2014, Tim Ferriss again. I can tell he's a favorite of yours, Sean. Quote, developing a safer spacecraft to replace the shuttle makes sense. If the new craft has a meaningful mission. Unfortunately, its first assignment, as Bush put it, will be, here he quotes the president himself, ferrying astronauts and scientists to the space station after the shuttle is retired. And then Ferris continues to say, a prospect every bit as dismal as it sounds. Can you give this new vehicle that you're developing a more meaningful mission than right. simply replacing the shuttle? More importantly, I think the president gave it a much more meaningful mission. The shuttle, by definition, is restricted to within about 300 miles of Earth's surface. Right. It was designed purposely for being in low Earth orbit. This is a capability to go beyond that, to go not just to the International Space Station, but back to the moon, to Mars, whatever destination you like. It is development of a capability that gets us out of low Earth orbit and can explore. When those conditions you know, are, are served up, as we talked about a little bit earlier, of when you have the robotic capabilities that have given you all the information or data you need that would inform the reasons why you'd have a human go visit and understand and pursue some scientific or discovery objective, then you have the means to do so. Oh, the vehicle right so right. the near-term proposition, I sure wish you know, some of the writers would look beyond the, the scope of just the, their hand right in front of their face. There's a lot more that this capability will provide for us. Uh, down the road. Tim Ferriss's point, of course, is get rid of that space station. You could just start sending it farther right away. But we've we've been through that. Uh, President Bush's third goal: quote, to return to the moon by 2020 as a launching point for missions, including the next steps of exploration, space exploration, human missions to Mars and to worlds beyond. Close quote. All right. Now we've been to the moon already. Obvious question: Why do we need to go back? Why not overshoot it and just go on? The duration and length of a trip back there is going to be something we'll continue to examine. But the issue is going back provides the capability to demonstrate how we use a Project Constellation crew exploration vehicle, how to set up the capacity potentially to launch from there to from the moon, moon potentially, uh, to establish the capabilities and look at what natural resources may be available there as well. There's a big brewing debate within the scientific community about how much or how little the resource opportunities to be availed on the moon may present. Let's go find out. Mm -hmm. Let's stop the debate and let's go find out. And it's, there's a number of opportunities to do it. Plus, the great advantage is the moon is 250,000 miles away. Mars is 150 million miles away. If you want to test out something, let's do it a little closer to home and understand what that'll take. Is NASA working its way back to Werner von Braun's original plan? His notion was to use the moon as a space station in the first place and launch from there. Is that is that what we're that's working a potential. on? It's a potential. Uh, there's again, this is an argument that, in, a, in a debate that continues of exactly how exhaustive would a capacity and infrastructure on the moon service. Mm -hmm. And not sure yet. Let's let's go figure it out. But it, the, the bottom line is, let's get the capability to go examine this, understand how to do it, and in the process, it also gives us the capacity to get beyond low Earth orbit into worlds beyond. Here's what this layman. Next, the relationship between NASA and private enterprise. There are a number of sources of income from the moon that different people consider at least plausible. Storing electronic data on the moon, building solar panels to produce electricity, tourism, a number of ways of generating income from having a presence on the moon. But these are the kinds of things that one would think begin to lend themselves to private enterprise rather than a public enterprise like NASA. The other thing that one discovers Googling around, I'm sure you're aware of this, is that there's one complaint after another that NASA attempts to be controlling, to keep all of space to itself, that it hasn't been reaching out to the private sector, that the time has come now 
uh, for reaching out to the private sector. And let me ask you what you're doing. Is that in general correct? I think so. What are you doing about it? Well, I think it's a very fair uh, assessment of it. And in many ways, if you think about uh, NASA's legacy in its earliest phase, right. it was a, uh, an institution that was extremely friendly and very created a climate and environment for entrepreneurs, innovators, technology developers, things with people with different ideas right. on how to accomplish objectives. And along the way, we become much more institutionalized. And a lot of the observations have been, how do you reopen this process to get those creative ideas back into this? And that's precisely what we're about doing. The transformation objectives we're after within the agency. In furtherance of the President's commission that mm -hmm. released its report on how to implement the strategies necessary to achieve this vision, really call for how do we you know, reconstitute ourselves, transform ourselves to do that. This, that pet, we're about. this past spring, Spaceship One was the name of the vehicle. Sure. First privately financed spacecraft to send the moon into space, just barely into space, but it did send a man into space mm -hmm. and bring him back down. Fantastic. Are you talking Fantastic. to those guys? Is, are there any commercial opportunities those that are, that opens up? That's precisely the kind of folks we want to continue to encourage out there. I mean, it is you know, the, the, the notion that, that a commercial privately developed capability has now come close to duplicating the same thing Alan Shepard did 40 years ago. Right. You know, is from a technical standpoint not a real marvel. From an from a, a, a uh, an expansion of market opportunities, it's a tremendous achievement. It's fantastic. This is precisely the kind of creativity, innovation, and I think entrepreneurship we need to be encouraging more. In a lot of ways, what the President's Commission talked about is we need to facilitate those kind of opportunities to develop on their own as, as uh, options for all of us to, to, uh, to appreciate and enjoy. Let me give you another one. Space engine, of course, you, you are talking to a, a layman here, so I Google around and find out about NASA what I can. And some of these things that I come across strike me as crazy, but then, of course, landing somebody on the moon seemed crazy 40 years ago. Space engineer Bradley Edwards, who's working on a grant provided by you guys, uh, has talked about the design of a space elevator which would lower the cost of taking people and cargo into space. First of all, will you explain to me in a way that I can understand what a space elevator would be? This is this again. And you may preface it by saying the whole thing is lunacy if you want to. No, no, no. It's it's not, is it? No, there's there are a number of, of concepts. Again, this is what made I think NASA's reputation in the beginning was looking at a number of different ideas that were considered to be how is this going to work? Right to something that becomes reality. In the old days, your institution was intellectually alive. I still think it is. You, it's still well, that's today. today. All right. And in, in many ways, what we're trying to do is regenerate that evidence of it. Okay. With regularity. So this tell me about the space elevator. Well, this is, this is, you know, it's a, it's a different idea of employing different uh, principles as a means to uh, use you know, gravitational condition and other means in order to um, launch capabilities and assess or access uh, those capabilities in principally low Earth orbit. Right. Uh, we're going to see and see how that works out. I mean, the concept of being and the idea is very is early. Super light, super strong cable, really, in uh, somehow or other attached to a satellite that's in geosynchronous orbit, right? And that that is sound. It isn't crazy. It, it might be. I don't know. I mean, it it, might we'll be. see. I mean, it's a, it's a concept that's been kicked around. And it's an idea that we're now going to evaluate that is as preposterous as some of the ideas advanced 40, 50 years ago. We'll see if this makes. There's a lot of interesting ideas. From new missions in outer space to new attitudes right here on the ground. Rick Tomlinson, founder of Space Frontiers Foundation, writing in Space Review. Quote, NASA's human space flight program is like an old ex-athlete who won the Olympics a long time ago, but it's bloated, inflexible, self-indulgent, and lives on reruns of better days, close quote. From the report of the gaming board. But otherwise, he thinks we're doing a great <laughs> job. <laughs> well, now, here's the, here's the, here, let me quote now from the report of the gaming board on the disintegration of the Columbia shuttle. And you've already spoken very highly of this report. Indeed, you said all the recommendations are sound, and you intend to abide by them. The accident was the result of, quote, persistent systemic flaws, close quote, in NASA management. The board, the game and board, recommended changes in NASA's culture, but conceded that, quote, the changes we recommend will be difficult to accomplish and will be internally resisted, close quote. We've been through the president's uh, goals for outer space. I want to know your goals. You've been there for about two and a half years. How do you, what levers do you as the manager, the man running that institution, have 
to change the institution? Are you hiring and firing people? Your budget is more or less capped. It's clear the Bush administration doesn't want to spend vastly more on it. How do you do this? How do you change that well, institution? You, you put a number of, of, of comments on the table, all of which were stated as fact, but unfortunately are not. Okay, go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> Adjust the question before you answer it. Thank you. Uh, first and foremost, the, the proposal the President's made this year right. is an increase in the NASA budget. It's the largest single domestic discretionary agency increase of any agency of the federal government except Defense and Homeland Security. What percentage increase is About 5%, 5 in order to, to pursue the President's vision as he laid it out. He's also laid out a five-year plan that defines exactly how we would resource that, how we'd finance it, how we'd pay for it. This is the first time this has been done in the better part of 30 years to have not only a policy, but a, a, a specific resource plan. How are you going to pay for it? Plan of how you do this. So therefore, the notion that somehow we're going to just kind of lump along on the same basis is wrong. The policy itself is different. It's vibrant. It's focused. It has a very specific set of objectives, and it's a path ahead of how to finance it. Okay. So that's the first step. So the first step, you helped help, help draft this, and what, sure. what you have now is a specific set of objectives. You bet. And right. that's the first major step in this culture change you're referring to that certainly the, the, uh, the Columbia Accident Investigation Board observed as well, which is you got to get a focus. you got to have a specific strategy. It's one of the central things that led to the observation you read as a, as a dramatic reading of what they observed which is, this is an agency that's a loose amalgam of lots of different right. things. What's the unifying theme? I said, unless and until the President of the United States makes a determination of what that unifying theme is, it's going to continue to bump along without direction. That's what the President delivered on January the 14th, a very clear direction of where to go, and a budget to support it, and a means to go carry it out, and a very specific strategy what about to morale? how you achieve it. What about morale? Your people have been beat sure. up. They've had... The shuttle would disintegrate in the air. Let me just step back to the last part of the, of the question, which you observed, again, which is how, what are the other things you need to do in order to achieve this transformation? It is, again, focus on those objectives. Right. Focus on that understanding of exactly what this strategy is all about. This becomes the unifying theme. And as a result, the reaction, I think, among our colleagues in NASA is, as, as pertains to morale, is, hey, this is great. We've got a direction. Mm -hmm. But what is it going to mean in terms of changes in the way we do business? And that's the part we've got to continue to work. That's the culture change right. that uh, Hal Gaiman and his colleagues on the Accident Investigation Board, I think, very astutely observed as part of the challenge we've got to confront. So What's the demographic in NASA? Have you got mostly older people now? Or have you got, is NASA once again an exciting place for young physicists and engineers and so forth? It's an interesting combination of both. The average age is my own. I'm 48. Mm -hmm. We have three times as many scientists and engineers over 60 as we have under 30. Really? So as a consequence, it, is a, it was a real change in the approach that was taken, uh, I think, in the last decade in terms of recruitment objectives and trying to look to this. So our approach is to recruit vigorously for the kinds of career fields and disciplines, professions. That's, it's, you know, that's a huge opportunity for you. You then, bet. As the older folks. Because what you get is the retire. expertise and the experience of the older uh, 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 professionals that are within our organization. At the same time, you bring in a new cadre of folks with new energy, new enthusiasm, and, and new ideas and approaches on how to accomplish that. You get the best of both worlds. We're at the right end. Final topic, predictions. Name the year by which you would feel reasonably confident we will have placed a human being on Mars. Uh, I wouldn't want to speculate on that. I think it's that would be a technology forecast of exactly what has to develop between now and then. Certainly, Can you give me a, a rough number of decades? Nice try. Two decades? Nice three decades? try. Nice try. I think the, the, the real fool's errand we've been after in the past has been to name a destination and pick a date to go match it because, gee, that's what really got us excited in the early 1960s. That's it not worked. what this is about. It's it's not, but that's not what this is about. It's about developing that capability and understanding how to do it, and doing so by knocking down those object objectives and the, the challenges of achieving that task uh, in turn. Power generation, propulsion, human gotcha. endurance challenges, all those are the things you must do in order to achieve Last that. question. The way you have just framed this, you are now asking the American people, the American taxpayers, to support a mission that is open-ended, to support it for some unknown number, some unknown but large number of years, year in and year out in an uninterrupted way at a cost of some billions of dollars every year. In a sentence, two at the most, because it's television, tell us again why 
sending a man to Mars will be worth it. For the price of a family of four to go to a movie one time a year for less than $50 per pa taxpayer, that's what we're investing. And from that comes a series of capabilities, improvements to our material lives here on Earth in ways that are countless. We've just begun to scratch it, you know, the surface of the kinds of things that benefit us in this discussion today. Those are benefits and opportunities that are prevent, presented to us for a fraction of that kind of cost. Great nations do great things. That's what we're about here. And you will increasingly invite the private sector to participate, offloading some of the costs off taxpayers onto investors, right? Absolutely. I'm just giving you the opportunity to stick that in no, as well. Absolutely. As you no want to. That's part of what, what this is all about. It's again creating an atmosphere to to uh, generate that entrepreneurial spirit we saw in Spaceship One. Sean O'Keefe, thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Pleasure to be with you. I'm Peter Robinson for Uncommon Knowledge. Thanks for joining us. We welcome your comments on this week's show. Our email address, comments at uncommonknowledge.tv. For more information about Uncommon Knowledge, please visit our website, www.uncommonknowledge.tv. Funding for this program was provided by the John M. Olin Foundation.